Until recently, many believed that the promise of progress in the 21st century would enable us to move beyond the barbaric horrors of the past towards a better and brilliant future. Many believed that we could go about our comfortable lives and that evil will simply pass us by. It will not. The horrors that Hamas perpetrated on October 7th remind us that we will not realize the promise of a better future unless we, the civilized world, are willing to fight the barbarians. Because the barbarians are willing to fight us. And their goal is clear. Shatter that promising future. Destroy all that we cherish and usher in a world of fear and darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a turning point, a turning point for leaders and nations. It is time for all of us to decide if we are willing to fight for a future of hope and promise or surrender to tyranny and terror. Now rest assured, Israel will fight. Since October 7th, Israel has been at war. Israel did not start this war. Israel did not want this war. But Israel will win this war. Hamas launched this war by perpetrating the worst savagery our people have seen since the Holocaust. Hamas murdered children in front of their parents, murdered parents in front of their children. They burned people alive. They raped women. They beheaded men. They tortured Holocaust survivors. They kidnapped babies. They committed the most horrific crimes imaginable. And they're part of the axis of evil that Iran has formed, an axis of terror that works by arming, training, and financing Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and other terror proxies throughout the Middle East and beyond the Middle East. In fighting Hamas and the Iranian axis of terror, Israel is fighting the enemies of civilization itself. Victory over these enemies begins with moral clarity. It begins with knowing the difference between good and evil, between right and wrong. It means making a moral distinction between the deliberate murder of the innocent and the unintentional casualties that accompany every legitimate war, even the most just war. It means holding Hamas responsible for the double war crime it commits every day by deliberately targeting Israeli civilians while deliberately using Palestinian civilians as human shields. It means making clear that the use of human shields is not only an immoral tactic of terror, but also an ineffective one. Because as long as Hamas's use of Palestinian human shields result in the international community blaming Israel, Hamas will continue to use it as a tool of terror, and so will others. Hamas will continue to use the basements in Gaza's hospitals as the command posts of its vast terror tunnel network. It will continue to use mosques as fortified military positions and weapon depots. It will continue to steal fuel and humanitarian assistance from UN facilities. While Israel is doing everything to get Palestinian civilians out of harm's way, Hamas is doing everything to keep Palestinian civilians in harm's way. Israel urges Palestinian civilians to leave the areas of armed conflict, while Hamas prevents those civilians from leaving those areas at gunpoint. Hamas is also preventing foreign nationals from leaving Gaza altogether. And most despicably, Hamas is holding over 200 Israeli hostages, including 33 children, holding them, terrorizing them, keeping them as hostages. Every civilized nation should stand with Israel in demanding that these hostages be freed immediately and freed unconditionally. I want to make clear Israel's position regarding a ceasefire. Just as the United States would not agree to a ceasefire after the bombing of Pearl Harbor or after the terrorist attack of 9-11, Israel will not agree to a cessation of hostilities with Hamas after the horrific attacks of October 7th. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas, to surrender to terrorism, to surrender to barbarism. That will not happen. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that there is a time for peace and a time for war. This is a time for war, a war for our common future. Today we draw a line between the forces of civilization and the forces of barbarism. It is a time for everyone to decide where they stand. Israel will stand against the forces of barbarism until victory. I hope and pray that civilized nations everywhere will back this fight. Because Israel's fight is your fight. Because if Hamas and Iran's axis of evil win, you will be their next target. That's why Israel's victory will be your victory. But make no mistake, regardless of who stands with Israel, Israel will fight until this battle is won. And Israel will prevail. May God bless Israel. And may God bless all those who stand with Israel. So the first question will go to News 18 India Niraj. Please take the microphone, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Niraj from India. I, I represent Network 18 Group in India. My question to you is that how do you see the India's stand on UN resolution? India abstained because in resolution, there was no condemnation of terrorism. I think that uh, resolution was deeply flawed. And I was sorry to see that uh, even many of our friends uh, did not insist that there would be a full and powerful condemnation of the horrors that were committed here, that are horrors that no civilized country, including uh, your country and so many others, would tolerate. So I hope that we don't see a repeat of these kinds of resolutions. Uh, we'll go now to ABC America, Matt Rivo. Thank you, sir. It seems that the level of support that you have amongst the Israeli public has dropped considerably. So the question is, how can you continue to lead this country effectively during a very difficult time, and have you at all considered stepping down? The only thing that I intend to have resign is Hamas. We're going to resign them to the dustbin of history. That's my goal. That's my responsibility. And that's what I'm leading the country to do. This is my responsibility now. And it's, a, it's something that I think unites the entire country. We're all supporting the soldiers. We're soldier, supporting our commanders. We're supporting the IDF. We're supporting, I think, the uh, unbelievable efforts of our reservists and our security forces. We'll continue to do that until victory. ZDF Germany, Michael. Good evening, sir. Michael Bivong, uh, Channel 2 German Television. I would like to ask you, there's a widespread discussion, especially among the relatives of the hostages, about the course of military action you have taken so far. And the question, if this is the only way to free the hostages, of course, you uh, are very uh, successful in freeing one hostage on Sunday. But there's a widespread criticism that this doesn't uh, allow uh, place for other negotiations. What do you explain to the relatives of the hostages for this cause, relying mostly on military pressure? I met uh, twice with the families of the hostages. You felt their anguish. I felt their anguish. Uh, I know this sense of, uh, it's not only the sense of loss that bereaved uh, parents have, it's a sense of uh, not knowing, of continuous, continuous anguish. So I, I fully understand their concern. But our common assessment of all of the, uh, not only the cabinet members, but also all the security forces in the military, is that the ground action actually creates the possibility, not the certainty, but the possibility of getting our hostages uh, out. Because Hamas will not do it unless they're under pressure. They simply will not do it. They only do it under pressure. This creates pressure. Uh, and again, we obviously, uh, greeted one hostage with uh, open arms after yesterday's uh, successful action by Shabak and the IDF. But we're committed to uh, getting all the hostages back home. We think that this method stands a chance. 
it's a goal that we're committed to. Channel 7 Australia, Chris. Mr. Prime Minister, Chris Reason from Channel 7 Australia. I want to ask a question from my country, and the people in my country are looking at this and wondering, they agree with you, they want you to chase down Hamas and terrorism and destroy terrorism in, in this region, etc. But people can't understand why so many have people, civilians, have to die in this process. You argue that Hamas is putting them up as human shields. Is that a good enough excuse? Are you inflicting here uh, collective punishment on the people of Palestine? Not a single civilian has to die. Hamas merely has to let them go to the safe zone that we created in southeastern Gaza Strip. There's a safe zone there. Not a single civilian has to die. But Hamas is preventing them from leaving, keeping them in the areas of conflict. So I think that you should uh, direct your questions to Hamas. But I can tell you one thing. We're going out of our way to prevent civilian casualties, not only by asking civilians to move, calling them to move, arranging a place for them to be, which is safe, also putting in uh, uh, humanitarian support, providing them with the means, with food, uh, with water, with medicine, and so on. Uh, I, I think that this question should be placed on Hamas. And the more it's placed on Israel, the more you're going to see this repeated again and again and again. So other groups, other criminal states, other criminal organizations will use civilians as human shields. We cannot give immunity to these terrorists. We cannot give immunity to these savages. We have to do everything we can to minimize civilian casualties, but we cannot give up the fight because then I think this uh, will have disastrous consequences, not only for the future of my country, but for the future of your country, your countries. This is a battle of civilization against barbarians. The barbarians will do something that civilized countries will never do. And civilized countries will make every effort to prevent this. And I'll give you one example. And I'll end with that because I have to go to uh, manage this war and lead it. In 1944, the Royal Air Force bombed the Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen. It's a perfectly legitimate target. But the British pilots missed. And instead of the Gestapo headquarters, they hit a children's hospital nearby. And I think 84 children were hardly burned to death. That is not a war crime. That is not something you blame Britain for doing. That was a legitimate act of war with tragic consequences that accompany such legitimate actions. And you didn't tell the Allies, don't stamp out Nazism because of such tragic consequences. They went to the end because they knew that the future of our civilization was at stake. Well, I'm telling you right now that the future of our civilization is at stake. We have to win this war. We'll do it by minimizing civilian casualties. And may we succeed. Thank you. Ron Dermer, Minister Dermer, is in the War Cabinet. And he can answer the questions to those people who didn't get their questions answered. I apologize that our Prime Minister's time is limited. We start with La Repubblica. Francesca. Yes, good evening. I've been in touch with the families, like everybody here. And what they ask is all for all. So my question is, is Israel ready to release Palestinian prisoners? Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I would like to ask you if yeah. Israel is ready to release Palestinian prisoners in exchange of the prisoners that Hamas is holding. Second thing, what's the state of your relationship with Russia? Because, I mean, Russia has been hosting Hamas. We saw what happened yesterday in Dagestan. Does the Israeli government think that Russia is aban abandoning Israel? Well, so first, on the first question, I'm not going to get into issues regarding negotiations with the um, negotiations for the return of the hostages. I can tell you uh, that our assessment is that the military operation, the expansion of the military operation over the last few days has helped advance both goals, which is to 
eliminate Hamas on the one side, its military machine, uh, and achieve our goal uh, in Gaza, but also to advance a potential um, a deal uh, for the hostages. I'm not going to comment uh, anything more than that. In the case of Russia, um, we've had a complicated relationship with Russia over the last uh, a few years. Uh, we have acted in Syria, as you know, uh, to stop Iran from entrenching itself in positions there, and we've done that in a way where we haven't clashed with Russia. Uh, it is a very complicated relationship. Uh, I don't know all the facts about what happened last night at the airport. Probably not much more than you do. We'll have to get to the bottom of it. Uh, but I think the best thing is to ensure that we can continue to have a normal relationship with Russia. Uh, we're obviously very concerned about the links between Iran and Russia. We know what Iran is providing Russia. There's always a question about what Russia is providing Iran. And we look at that uh, literally every day to make sure that our vital interests, that Israel's vital interests, are not threatened. CGTN China. Zhao. Um, yeah. Wait for a moment, sir. You'll get the microphone. Uh, Joe with CGTN. Uh, there is a significant concern uh, about a like, wider conflict in the region as we see the U.S. deployment and military deployment increase uh, at the stage. So uh, how is the World Co Cabinet is responding to this? And another um, issue that's concerning uh, the ongoing phase two is that will your World Cabinet create a buffer zone later for the uh, southern safety in Gaza? Thanks. Will, I'm sorry, the end of the second create question. Will we create a buffer zone? Buffer zone in Gaza for the southern safety. For the southern? For your country's southern safety. I didn't, I didn't. Oh, so, uh, for safety, a, a zone in the south. Yeah, uh, thanks. Look, uh, so first, as your first question, obviously that we, we see the risks of escalation. Uh, we don't seek uh, an escalation in the north, but we have to prepare for it. You know that our military is deployed, and there have been back and forth with Hezbollah now for, uh, for a couple of weeks, for even longer. Uh, our policy is deterrence in the north to prevent that escalation there and a decisive victory in the south. Uh, and I think thus far that strategy is working, but I can't tell you what the situation will be tomorrow or the next day or the next day because we're not the only player here. There's a player on the other side, and Hezbollah may decide that they're going to escalate and we're going to have to respond. Uh, and we're prepared for that. We hope they don't make that mistake. They made a mistake, I think, in 2006. I think the leader of Hezbollah said if he knew what the response was going to be, he never would have started it. Believe me, the response now will make what happened in 2006 look like child's play. So hopefully we won't get there. The United States is working with us to ensure that there's not uh, an escalation. They have two battle carrier groups in, in the region now, which is a serious uh, a show of force. Uh, the United States has also acted in the region recently, and I think it's gotten the attention, as, uh, as the United States put it, both of state and non-state actors, which I suppose is a diplomatic way of saying Iran and Hezbollah. And I think they're focused on that, and I'm pleased to say that the, the strength of the relationship between the United States and Israel is, I think, clear every day during this battle in order to achieve those two objectives, deterrence in the north and a decisive victory in the south. As for what will happen as the war continues, I can't answer that now. What I will tell you is that there is this uh, safe zone, safe humanitarian zone in the south. I think the, the prime minister may have said it was in the southeast. It's in the southwest. Uh, and I think people have started to move there, and we've also ramped up a lot of humanitarian assistance. I think you're going to see a big increase in humanitarian assistance. I know you're going to see it in the next two or three days. And so hopefully we'll get the people and we'll get the assistance both in a place where they'll be out of harm's way, and then we'll be able to do the operations in the north. And as you've seen, I don't know the exact numbers, uh, but what's happening in the northern part of the Strip is that Israel is, is killing a lot of terrorists. And civilians have left that area. About 90% of, in terms of the areas that we're acting in now, 90% of the people have left those areas. Uh, and we hope they stay down south and keep them out of harm's way. Sky UK. Take the microphone, please. Thank you. Um, 
how much responsibility do you think the Prime Minister needs to personally accept for the lapse in security that led to the October the 7th attacks? And do you acknowledge that the threat from Hamas was downplayed? Well, look, Israel has a long history of checking into these matters and having thorough investigations, and I am sure uh, that everybody's going to ask a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions myself, and everybody's going to have to give a lot of answers, but I think to actually have that conversation now is not going to help us prosecute the war. Right now, we are trying to do everything to unite the country and to win the war. That's the most important thing. And afterwards, I'm sure there'll be time for all of those questions. And you and others and the people of Israel, first and foremost, deserve to get answers from everybody. The prime minister, every minister in the government, every military official or intelligence official. And we're going to have to stand and give those answers. But now is not the time to do it. CBS. Thank you. Yes. Um, the prime minister was able to free Gilad Shalit by freeing 1,000 prisoners. Now we know there are about 239 hostages, 6,000 prisoners. Seems like a better deal. What do you say to that? I say I'm not going to discuss hostage negotiations uh, of what the cabinet will do. I will tell you that those decisions uh, are actually not made by the war cabinet. They'd, be have, they'd have to be brought to the security cabinet, and then I believe to the government of Israel. The full government would have to vote on whatever decision is made. Right now, we're continuing our operation to achieve the military objectives, uh, military objectives to eliminate Hamas's military capability, to end Hamas's rule in Gaza, to ensure that Gaza won't pose a threat to Israel. And one of the goals of the operation is to bring back uh, those hostages. So right now, those goals are working in tandem. Uh, and if there's a, a potential deal that can be made, that would be brought to the appropriate forum in Israel. And I guess you'll have an answer to your question. New York Times, Patrick? No, New York Times, it's not there? There he is, sorry. Thanks, Minister. Um, your stated goal is to remove Hamas from power in Gaza. That will involve retaking the whole of the enclave. If and when you do that, what is your plan for the day after? Who will control Gaza? Will you hand it over to the Palestinian Authority? Will Israel stay in charge of it? What will you do? So first of all, I don't know if the premise is right, that it's going to, re it's going to require getting, taking over every single inch. There's a lot of questions there that are going to have to be decided as we prosecute the war militarily. I think your larger question is what's going to happen the day after. I think everybody is united that Hamas can't be there. We can't even leave uh, a remnant of Hamas there. It'll go back. I think I learned once you take a starfish, and if you cut all the legs up and you throw it back, it all grows back. So even if you have a, a small part of Hamas and you leave it on a territory in Gaza, it will eventually grow. We're not going to be able to change the reality for the people who live uh, uh, in the south of Israel unless we eliminate Hamas. Now, what does elimination mean? Does that mean going to the last bullet or not? It's a separate question. We'll have to decide. The day after, uh, I think there's a lot of ideas that are out there. But it's premature to discuss it now. There's a lot of proposals. We all know what we don't want, which is Hamas. What we want for the future, I think there's a lot of different ideas and different suggestions. Uh, but it's simply premature to do it. It's going to take us some time. Uh, but we have to have a different reality for the people in the south. My, I'm speaking my own personal opinion is that southern part of Israel around Gaza has to be the safest place in this country to live. That's how we'll know we succeed. When that becomes the safest place in the country to live, then we know that we have uh, defeated Hamas and we've created a new reality. I'm sorry, I've only got time for two more questions. I apologize, we haven't had a question yet from Latin America, so uh, from Argentina. Roman. My name is Roman Lechman. Roman, please. Okay, thank you. My name is Roman Lechman from Infobae, Argentina. Uh, would you suspend the military offensive in Gaza in exchange for the freedom of hostage captured by Hamas or not? Would we suspend the operation? Yes. Well, there's a... It is possible. All right, so what you have, obviously, our goal, we plan to achieve, that military goal that I'm talking about. When you're dealing with um, getting hostages out, we had a case, we've had now 
two different cases of two people being released, and in a certain area, we didn't do operations for a certain amount of time to make sure that those people could leave safely. As I said, if there's going to be an, uh, an agreement, if there's going to be a proposal that's going to free uh, our hostages, we will obviously do whatever we can to ensure that they can get safely to where they need to get. Uh, but that would be a temporary cessation uh, of operations in order to actually get your, fit your hostages physically to safety. Last question, PBS. Dorit is walking up with a microphone. I want to apologize to everyone who couldn't ask a question, but my time is not unlimited. Thank you. Uh, Leila Milana Allen from the PBS NewsHour. To what extent have you changed your battle plans after consultations with the Americans, and specifically President Biden's request that you dif differently scale your operations in Gaza? So uh, I think it's a broader question. First, I'll say that the United States is in lockstep with Israel in terms of the goals of the operation, meaning eliminate Hamas's military, um, end its rule in Gaza, and make sure that Gaza is not a threat uh, to Israel. All of, and obviously to, to return the hostages, which I believe there are 10 uh, American hostages as well. So we're fully lined up. Now the question is the how. How do you go about doing it? And they have been very helpful, frankly, in offering advice. They send generals here, which I'm sure you've covered that have expertise in the types of battles that we may find ourselves uh, in, whether it was in Mosul or Fallujah and others. I myself met with the team. Um, uh, Gadi Eisenkot and Benny Gantz uh, met with them. I think our military met with them to, to hear what they had to say and what the lessons were learned were, because I think the difference between Fallujah and Mosul is the Americans themselves had learned a lot of lessons in Fallujah that they applied to Mosul. So that has been very helpful. Uh, and I think we share a common goal of defeating Hamas in a way that minimizes the civilian casualties, uh, not just the civilian casualties on the Palestinian side, but also because of our troops. We're going into areas that can be quite dangerous for our troops. So we're very appreciative of that. Uh, and I can tell you, as somebody who served as uh, ambassador of Israel to the United States for seven and a half years, I think that the level of cooperation and coordination that you have now is unprecedented in the history of the relations between our two countries. There's not a day that goes by where I don't have a call to the White House. The Prime Minister has spoken to President Biden maybe every, every other day, if not more, in the last 24 days. I think they've had something like 10, 12 phone calls. Uh, and other people in our administration speak to people in their administration all the time. Our Defense Minister is constantly in touch uh, with the Defense Secretary, the Secretary of Defense. Um, they're bringing a big aid package that they've supported that President Biden has talked about to make sure that we have the weapons we need uh, to defend ourselves. Uh, and I think they have been very helpful also in projecting American power uh, in the region so that that policy of deterring in the north and having a decisive victory in the south will be effective. So all in all, I'm very thankful uh, for that relationship. They're also helping us get humanitarian assistance because a lot of people look at Israel and say, why don't you make sure that you get the humanitarian assistance going to these places? We're not there. Uh, it's not coming in from the Israeli side. It's coming in from the Egyptian side. We have to inspect it. But there are other players there as well. There's Egypt. There's the Red Cross. There's the WHO. There's a lot of different moving parts to this. And I can tell you the United States from day one was focused on this issue. Uh, and I think it helped us also focus on it faster so that we can get that assistance to the people who need it. So we're very grateful that we have a friend in the United States of America and in President Biden. Uh, and hopefully that will um, help us do the things we need to do to both win the war, but do it in a way that, as I said, minimizes civilian casualties and also protects our troops. Well, I think the reason why I, the answer is a little more complicated is you have to understand Israel had to come up with a battle plan in a very short amount of time. So in the process that we're coming up with our battle plan, we're also having American input into it. So they've been part of that process. Uh, so what was the exact impact? It's not like we had this plan A come to the Americans. It's we were working through these issues, and they were there at that critical time to help us, I think, 
get to the plan we have today. And thus far, as this operation has expanded in the northern part of the Strip, thus far the situation has been better than a lot of people expected, which I think is good and I hope it stays that way. The key, I think, was getting the population out of the northern part of the Strip. I think there were about 1.1 million people in the north, about 800,000 people have left. There were about 300, a little over 300,000 uh, that remain. There are facilities in the north that we do not target. There are areas, UN schools, hospitals, things like that, where you had close to about 200,000 people right now. So you had, when the operation started on Friday night, I think you had about 150,000 left of a population of 1.1 million. Since the more ground forces came in, a lot of that population, I don't know the exact number, but a lot of that population has moved south. So we're in a theater now where you have many, many fewer civilians there, and that's enabled us to minimize civilian casualties and focus on killing the terrorists, which we are doing uh, in big numbers, uh, striking tunnels, striking against terrorist fighters, and hopefully that, that will continue. Thank you. Thank you all.